Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, I, yeah, for me, it's always the walking Christ is just an everyday journey. It's always been an everyday journey, and so just kind of take every day as it comes, and with as much consistency as possible. We all go through struggles. We all go through temptations, and all the rest of it. And um, but the thing about Christ is He provides security when we're insecure or when we don't have that security so we're grateful that we're able to lean on the security of christ and i just want everyone to be encouraged in that regard that temptation is real and it's for everyone and um attack from the enemy distraction from the enemy is real and it takes place in all of our lives um but we have an anchor that we lean on Praise the Lord. And you were saying about mention, uh, you was mentioning about notes. And I also want to encourage everyone, and I think everyone does it now anyway, but to definitely have a notepad available to um, be able to write down what God's speaking to you through the studies, but also just in general when God speaks to you, etc., etc. Hirot, I hope you have your notepad ready to take notes also, and welcome. Um, yeah, so we bless God. Tasha, are you good? I am well, thank you. Cool, cool. So just before I open in prayer, um, I've just been doing some research and certain things like I always have this curiosity as to what kind of conversations the world is having at this particular time and it's not it's never shocking or surprising really but one of the most recent things I just watched a little bit earlier is a guy just saying to people that the best thing you can do for your body is exercise and as a man that's the best thing you can do for yourself and I was just in awe of how wrong that is or how contradictory that is and his advice was that men need to work on their fitness above all things and women need to do squats above all things um and it's so modern and contemporary and uh it but it also shows the carnality of the world that we live in today the carnality of the as jesus said to peter you mind things of the flesh praise the lord you mind things of the flesh. We're just worried about things of the flesh. The Bible says that physical exercise is good, but spiritual exercise is better. It says in Timothy. And so it's. Uh, I just want to encourage the saints that this is the best thing you can do for your spirit or for your life in general. This is the best thing we can do. Physical exercise is cool. Spiritual exercise is great because that we take with us into the next life or that we take with us throughout life. Um, it's not temporary, it's eternal, you know, so um, not to get wrapped up in contemporary or temporary things. Um, Storm's in school right now, so that's a good example, and she's focused and she's going to do the best with what God's placed in front of her, but now Storm is saved, so that is not the be-all and end-all of her life, uh, but what is the be-all and end-all is Christ. You know, I remember when I was in university and that was my hope to a future. And then I got saved in 2012 and I continued in university until 2013. But when I got saved, I just lost my passion for uni after that because it no longer meant what it meant to me before. Because before it meant like a way out in this world. But then after getting saved and the, the delight in Jesus and the excitement of Jesus and the way that he was transforming my life, um, the university lost weight. I actually came back from Brazil. The first time I went to Brazil, I came back the exact same day or the day before my graduation. And um, I didn't have any preparation for it. And I was just there and I just breezed through it. There was no great celebration because I was just so grateful that I was in Christ. And that was what was most important to me. And so we, it's a win-win, saints. Oh, we're to storm. Whoever's in education, it's a win-win because, um, yeah, you can you can use the tools that God's placed in front of you. You can use that. It's good. 
but the most important tools is the tools that we learn in the scripture the most important tools is the two tools that jesus gave us and um that's what we should be focused on as opposed to temporary and contemporary things does anyone have anything to share pertaining to that Yeah, um, it kind of speaks to me <laughs> because I've been thinking I wanted to do some exercises, which is quite funny. <laughs> so for you to bring up that conversation, it's kind of like, yeah, put my mind and um, focus back on the things of God rather than the temporary things like exercise and stuff. Not saying that you can't do that, but um, yeah, uh, just remember what's more important. Amen, KK. So could you open us in prayer on that note? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And I just pray, Lord, for your presence. We just invite you now into our hearts, into our lives, Lord. We just pray that you'll lead us all into the word, that you'll direct us, that you'll teach us that you'll speak to each and every individual in this room, Lord. We pray for your word to be sown into our hearts on good soil, on good ground, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that the enemy won't be able to snatch any seed. We pray that the word will increase our faith, our stature in you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you continue in the things of you and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, sorry. I pray that you'll give us all the strength and the ability in this season, Lord God. And we just pray that you'll speak to us all personally and as a collective body, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And it's funny because I was going to say to the saints, like, we definitely in the West, we need to step up our amen game. Because I know in Ethiopia, when the minister's preaching and the crowd is, they're very strong in their, in their united amen. Amen. When the, when the preacher's preaching, amen. Like the agreement, the solidarity. But then I also saw it in a Chinese fellowship recently where all the Chinese people were just, amen. Amen, there's this passion. And just to remember that amen means so be it or agree. You're agreeing. So you don't say amen to what you don't agree to, but you also say amen to what you accept and want to receive in your life. Praise God. Um, yeah, it's very important. Without further ado. Yeah, Nicole, if you know where we're at, you can bring it up. Oh, Etu, if you want to participate in the reading today, I know you've got short time. Just throw your hands up. If you're not able to, that's fine. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. And if anyone else wants to read, just throw your hands up. So we're starting in Romans chapter 16. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh the saints, as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she has need for you for she has been a succorer of many and of myself also. And even if we just kind of highlight that, there's, there's roles for the women in ministry, you know? The Bible never excluded women from ministry. It excluded them from particular. It excluded them from particular roles, but there is roles for women in ministry, not the feminist roles that we've introduced in the 21st century but feminine roles. There's many feminine roles within the church that is required. And so it's, it's a good look when we see Apostle Paul commending 
um, a sister in the Lord. And it's in order as well, you know. So I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as become of saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she has need of you, for she has been a Socorro of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Priscilla and Aquila, that's her husband and wife, they've put their necks on the line, as in that they're ready to get their heads chopped off. Um, for Apostle Paul's life. And not only he's grateful, but the churches of the Gentiles are grateful. Uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 5, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. The church that is in their house. Church doesn't have to be in a building. The church that is in their house. House church, which is how it really started before we had these grand temples expensive temples that god is not pleased with salute my well beloved epinetus who is the first fruits of ashea unto christ greet mary who bestowed much labor on us yeah it's not specific which mary that was because there is a number of marys in the new testament salute andronicus and junia my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Great Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. You see, there was many that was in Christ before Apostle Paul came, but Apostle Paul's the one that got to write the New Testament. It's not about how many years You've been in Christ, it's about how much God is using you. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Statues, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus household. That's definitely like a Greek name. Aristobulus household. The helper in Christ, the approved in Christ, and the Aristobulus household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus. Sounds like narcissist. Of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis. These are a lot of these are Roman names, isn't it? Because we're talking to the Church of Rome. So these may be Western, possibly white people at the time as well. Um, salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Praise God. And his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes. These, these are definitely Roman names. And the brethren, Hermes is the delivery, the delivery trucks that delivered a lot of things to our house today, isn't it? But it was also the name of a Roman god. Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Um, salute Philo Philologos and Julia Nereus and his sister and Olympus, which is where we get the word Olympics from, and that was also a god. Um, so a lot of these people were named after Roman gods, and that's quite interesting, actually. And all the saints which are with you, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. See that there, the kiss, the holy kiss that we've been speaking about recently. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which
which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Let me read that again. I beseech you, brethren, I warn you, brothers and sisters, I'm preparing you, brothers and sisters, take note of those people that come to cause division in the church and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And what does the scripture say? Avoid them. Avoid them. But we're Christian. We're not supposed to avoid anyone because God loves everyone. Avoid them. But God is love. Avoid them. When I was teaching yesterday about Christmas and the Bible talks about not to eat with such people. Now the scripture here is saying avoid these people. Which people? The people that come to cause division and offenses, which is stumbling blocks. Things to trip you up that are contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Learn from where? Learn from the scriptures. Avoid them. That's amazing. And if anyone has any thoughts on that, remember it for us. Because as believers, we're taught today, don't avoid anyone. Talk to everyone. Fellowship of everyone. Scripture says avoid this kind of people. What does avoiding even look like? Avoiding is like when you see someone and you turn the other way. And then it tells you why. Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. They do not serve Jesus, these people, but they their own belly. Their God is their belly. I was talking about that yesterday. Their God is their belly. They don't serve Jesus. They serve their belly. They serve their bellies. Their belly is their God. Food is their God. And belly doesn't just mean food. It's whatever appetite you have that is the passion of your flesh. That's their God. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Did you hear that? Very important. How do they deceive you? These people that you're supposed to avoid, Christians, my sisters and brothers in this room, there's certain people you're supposed to avoid. And these people, the scripture says, they deceive you by good words and good speech. Like Barack Obama, people that have good words and good speech, they speak nice. They speak in a way that sounds sweet to your ears. And it says, because of these good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of who? The simple. So you're hearing people and they're talking and it sounds cute and it sounds nice. Women pay attention to that because women are driven emotionally when they listen to things. You hear it, it sounds sweet, it sounds cute, and because of that, you're deceived. 19, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good. And simple concerning evil. Be wise pertaining to that which is good, and be simple concerning that which is evil. I believe another translation says, can we see the NIV translation just for that and pull it back quickly? Um, but in verse, in verse um, uh, 19, it says, I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. And another scripture says that you should be like children when it comes to evil. All right. All right, let's put it back to KJV. Verse 20. Verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly the god of peace shall bruise satan under your feet shortly what does that scripture pertain to let me show you very quickly what this scripture pertains to if you pull up genesis chapter 3 very quickly because this scripture is very important Genesis chapter 3, Old Testament, thousands of years ago, a prophecy was given, and go to the bottom of the page, a prophecy was given, 
to Eve, the mother of all women. Go up a little bit. Up a little I bit. I think it's 3.14, Chuka. Genesis 3.14, okay. Thank you. So, so look here. And the Lord God said, unto the serpent because you have done this you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field and on your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life so god was talking to the satan there and 15 it says and i will put enmities between you and the woman between who between satan i'm going to put enmity and just for context for anyone who doesn't understand this is when the serpent the snake in the garden who was operating as satan deceived eve and she ate from the tree and god said to eve i'm going to put or he said to say and i'm going to put enmity division between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed it shall bruise your head so the seed of the woman shall bruise your head satan's head and you shall bruise his heel you he um it shall bruise your head and women don't carry seeds. So the prophecy meant the Messiah that came through Mary, which didn't have a father because women don't carry seed, men do. So God says thousands of years before that the, that the um, seed of the woman, which women don't carry seeds, so it could only be Jesus because he didn't have a father. Therefore, Mary was carrying the seed of God. Shall bruise your head, talking about the serpent. And then we go back to the scripture that we was at. Are we in the last chapter of Romans? That's awesome. So we're going into Corinthians tonight. Um, we're beyond 20. Okay. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. You see? So that's how the Bible is. You connect the dots from Old Testament and New. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. God said to Eve in the garden, your seed shall bruise his head. Who is the seed? The seed is Christ. And who is Christ? Christ is the church because we're the body of Christ. So we're stamping out Satan because we represent Christ on earth. Amen. We represent Christ. We're his body. So the seed of the woman is the church, the same seed that is mentioned in Romans chapter 12. The seed of the woman that was born and the enemy makes war with them. That's the church. Christ is the church. We represent Christ. Amen. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That was a prophetic statement, Apostle Paul. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timotheus, Timothy, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason and Sosipata, so sociopath. No, I'm joking. Sosipata, my kinsman, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Did you see that? It says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle. I, Tertius. Tertius is the one writing this particular letter. Salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, salute you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salute you. And Quartus, brother, I just want to pause there for a second, just in case anyone gets confused by that. Tertius says, I wrote this epistle. Apostle Paul is the one talking in the epistle. Apostle Paul had writers that wrote his letters for him, and there may be reason for that. Because Apostle Paul speaks of an infirmity, a sickness that he has. And it's alluded in scripture to his eyesight. And it's mentioned a few times in the letters that he writes in big words for a particular reason. Jesus blinded Apostle Paul for three days and he got his eyesight back. Did he get his eyesight back completely? We don't know. But we know that he says he has a sickness and he mentions that if the church could borrow their eyes to him, they would. So there's a lot of alluding to Apostle Paul having an eye problem. And here we have Tertius saying, I wrote this, but yet the whole letter is written from in the perspective of Apostle Paul, saying, I am Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. But it was written by someone else who may have been joining him in their cells. Um, I, 
Tertius, you wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, salute you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you and quarters a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Praise the Lord. Since the world began, but now is made manifest. You see that? The revelation of the mystery, which was a secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, is revealed now. There's no more mystery in the church. It's been revealed. But now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. To God only wise. God is the only wise, not the wisdom of Satan, not the wisdom of Dr. Patel, not the wisdom of Dr. Shankar, not the wisdom of modern day philosophers, not the wisdom of conservatives. God only wise. Wisdom comes from God. Amen. Written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Centria. So the person who sent this letter was a woman also, Phoebe, the woman that was mentioned at the beginning of the chapter. So praise the Lord. That chapter was more of a closing letter because I realize we're going into Corinthians tonight, which is exciting. Um, that was a closing letter. He's just shouting out all the men, them, all the, all the women, um, shouting out all the saints of old and just giving them their greetings. So praise the Lord. So I've shared my thoughts and now the floor is open for everyone to share or ask questions. So. I bet you can't hear you, bro. Can't hear anything from your microphone. Hear me now. I think so, yes. Is it perfect? I can speak. Keep speaking. Yeah, I just want to say something. Can you hear me? No, not really. No, no, it's not. It's not clear. It's delayed and it's also cutting out. And maybe it will come in in a in a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? I just switched to data to no, mobile okay. data. Okay. Um. So with the salutations. It just, for me, it just kind of represents, uh, I don't know if this is true, but it represents how he had a personal relationship with every single person he mentioned, you know, just calling them by name and so forth. And that is not something that churches practice now. Nowadays, it's just like, okay, uh, thank you to the music team. Uh, time the passes on me. Like heard their names once and never asked again, you know. So um, it just shows the importance um, of of knowing the people who are in your walk with you. Uh, for me, but yeah, that's all I really got from this. Yeah, go ahead, Kaylee. Sorry, I was just writing down. Um, I'm really done it now. I was just writing down what the way to was saying. Um, but basically, it wasn't um, that I got it from uh, any particular verse, but what I received from it was that we all have our part to play in the body of Christ. We have our callings and positions. And then the next part, which was verse 17, Oh, which you've got it here, say, the body of Christ should not be divided, but the children of God and the world should be divided. And it just reminds me when I was reading John 10. So I've just got the verse here. John 10, 
19 so jesus basically spoke a parable about the sheep um and my sheep hear my voice so there was there was jews that were listening um but there was like a division so i'm just going to read it um some believed that he was like the christ and some didn't so it says there was a division therefore among sorry there was a division therefore again among the jews for these sayings and many of them said he has a devil and is mad why hear ye him others said these are not the words of him that have a devil can a devil open the eyes of the blind so there's a when in christ there should be that division but it shouldn't be in the church but it should be between the church and the world so that's what i kind of got out of that also it, so it just reminded me of that scripture and then the last thing was when um she was saying that paul could have had obviously an eye problem uh what came to me at the time was that just because paul could have had an eye problem it doesn't mean he could not be used for God's purpose so even if we have limitations God can still use us and to fulfill what he has planned for us so yeah that's it thank you well praise God not thank you amen Moses had a speech problem whether that was stuttering or just couldn't speak properly and was the greatest prophet in history before Jesus. Go ahead. At the time when I got that, I was thinking about Tamara for her speech, which was quite funny. So you said about Moses and um, his speech. And I was just thinking at the time, I was kind of thinking about Tamara because obviously at the moment, she can speak, but obviously we know that it's going to be used for God's glory, this situation. But yeah, that kind of came to mind as well. Amen. Slow in speech, but wise. Um, any other thoughts? Asha, Tia, Storm, Nicole, are they here? It's interesting because when we see a few women being called out in the scripture, Priscilla, Phoebe, um, and being called holy women of the church and saints, and then when modern day feminists, so-called Christians hear Apostle Paul say women should keep silence in the churches and should not preach over men, they become offended with Apostle Paul and they say he hated women and that's why he said that, right? But then you see Apostle Paul also loved women. He had women in his ministry. Apostle Paul also mentions in scripture that he has the right to have women that walk with him. Even though he's not married, he has women that walks with him like close sisters. And so it's very clear then that Apostle Paul has nothing against women. He has something against disorder. And whatever God has placed as order of the church is what we're supposed to put above our feelings. And so in the scripture, we see greet Mary, greet Phoebe, greet Priscilla, and many women's names, right? Um, but they wasn't preachers in the church. They were helpers. They were servers in the church. They were carrying even the letters, as we see this letter was sent by Phoebe. Um, and they wasn't limited in that regard, They, but there was a limitation as it pertains to the order of male and female, um, which ought to be established, praise the Lord. So that's another interesting one from this chapter.
I was just thinking, you see where it says in verse 6, greet Mary. That could have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the reason I say that is because the Bible never puts any special context around her name. She's Mary. She's a sister in Christ. She was never to be worshipped. Remember, Mary was among the first believers. She was there speaking in tongues with them. She was there fellowshipping, doing Holy Communion. She wasn't the center of attention like you see in the pictures today within the Catholic and Orthodox churches, etc. She was another woman. Six, greet Mary. Which Mary? We don't know. But it wasn't important to know which Mary. There was no highlight around her name or capital Mary. She's Mary. She done her role. Jesus resurrected. And now she's a part of the body of Christ. She's our sister. She's not our God. She's not our leader. She's our sister. Um, so yeah, just the fact that it says greet Mary. And there is a few Marys. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And a few Marys in scripture. But we don't even know which Mary this is talking about here which shows that it wasn't important to know which Mary we're talking about. He's just saying to greet her. Um, no more thoughts, otherwise we'll go into the new letter of the Corinthians. For me, my last thought is just all of the pagan names that I'm seeing in the chapter. A lot of the names are Roman pagan names. Right? And a lot of them were names like Hermes, which is the name of a god. There's many different Roman gods that they had. And so I find it interesting that Apostle Paul was calling out these pagan names and calling them his brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the Romans, the Western people are saved. They're in Christ and we're all rejoicing, even with their pagan names that was probably named after different gods. But now they're in Christ. They don't have to rename themselves. Like today, there's a lot of people, especially Hebrew Israelites, that change their name because it makes them feel holy. But in the Bible, we see even with a pagan name, you can be saved. Your name might be pagan. God can still save your life, even with that pagan name, um, <clears throat> etc. So. <clears throat> Did someone else just join in? Yeah, Dwayne. Good to have you, Dwayne. Welcome. So, we're going to go on to the next chapter, which I believe is Corinthians. I'm going to ask Oetu to read because um, he may not be able to stay with us beyond the next 10 minutes. So, it's better for him to read this chapter. Um, yeah, pull it over. So we're in First Corinthians now, and I'm always like shocked at the speed of this Bible study Wednesday because we've gone so far already. The New Testament isn't that big, and we're already in Corinthians. So Corinthians is a lot. So listen, if you need a new notepad, get your new notepads because now we're getting into real doctrines. You know, if Romans was the foundation. Romans was what it looks like to be saved as a Gentile when you're not a Jew. It talks about Israel and the first fruit. But now Corinthians, we're talking about everyday life. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about sin. We're talking about temptation. We're talking about a lot of things. So I just want um, everyone to be ready and equipped. Praise God. But wait till you can go ahead. <clears throat> Amen. Paul called to be an apostle a pastor of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which was at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enri enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end, 
that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of uh, Steph Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 17. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after, the, uh, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews and st a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them, oh, powerful, 22, 23. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Does God even have a weakness? For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised had God chosen ye and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him that are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto his unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay, can we please roll back up to verse seventeen, I believe. Amen. So <clears throat> verse seventeen for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So to me, this was highlighted because you often hear sermons from your, your mega churches and big name pastors, and they are always trying to include sort of this crazy analogy to add to the word of God. Meanwhile, there is no need, you know, things like, uh, I believe this one video was sent in the group where 
the one guy, I think it was Mike Todd's um, mentor, where he said, Jesus is my favorite stripper. You know, trying to create an image in people's minds, trying to be wise, you know. Meanwhile, he's removing the reverence away from this, the crucifixion of Christ, you know. Um, and that message was made of non effects. Like, like, what repentance do I need after hearing that Jesus is my favorite stripper? Like, what, what, what do I have to review within myself? Like, after hearing that, there's no sin in repentance. It's just Jesus, my favorite stripper that I could find at a club two streets away from my house. So, the the word of God is made of non effect just because of that. And then in verse 18, he says, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is, it is the power of God. Many times um, I've essentially laid out the, the, I've said the gospel of Jesus Christ and to people outside of this, they see it as bondage. Like just for the fact that I don't celebrate my birthday then they're like, oh no, but you're not living your life to the full. Like, bro, my life means nothing to me. Uh, I'm free. Like, I'm not tied to anyone having to say happy birthday for me to be validated. I'm free, you know. I don't need external val validation for anything. Um, so to them, they just think it's bondage. It's like slavery. It is slavery, but it's a freedom kind of slavery. Um, only a person who's in Christ would understand, you know. And then um, I think verse 27 or 28 is also where I wanted to say something. Yes, 23, 23. Sorry, 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 Nicole. My apologies, my sister. So, but we preach Christ. Of, oh, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness it is so wild to me how christ who died for your sins is considered a stumbling block because you rely on your works so much you rely on the law so much that christ is a stumbling block to you you know i i, I yeah it's, it's really wild to me how christ is a stumbling block to the jews you know like if one of the Jews eat pork uh, out of the faith that they have in Jesus Christ, then that person is com considered to be a stumbling block and so forth. So things like that, where they don't rely in the grace of Christ. Um, I've, I've encountered one Adventist where I mentioned the whole pork eating thing and apparently I'm lawless, you know. Um, <laughs> So it's it's really a thing, you know. Um, the things that they faced in the churches back then, we still face now. Um, and then the last thing I would love to speak on, um, please scroll down to the bottom. <clears throat> oh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to con confound the things which are mighty. I was actually talking to um, someone today regarding this. And I was essentially telling them how when Christ said, I, I think it's in Luke or Mark, when Christ was saying that the taxpayers and the prostitutes will taste the kingdom of God before you. Uh, I think he was speaking to the Pharisees at the time. I was just thinking about how those people, the taxpayers and the prostitutes, are looked down upon in this world. And yet, that is exactly who God looks up to in order to advance the gospel. You know, looking at Apostle Paul, who used to, um, I almost said crucify the church. What, what's the word? Um, he used to essentially judge the church and, you know, commit murder and, oh, persecute the church, yes. 
and yet he was the one God used to advance the gospel. So it is very true what the scripture says that it's always the people who are frowned upon that are usually the ones who advanced the gospel. Even just looking at Christ himself, who was a carpenter and was chosen to advance the gospel. So, amen. That's all I have to say regarding this chapter. Thank you. That's what I was going to say as well. I was going to pick up verse 27 and look at Christ himself. I'm just thinking about the way the world operates right now. Like a lot of things that the world um, fosters weakness, like in terms of like, I don't know, if someone starts a situation like you're weak, you back down, that sort of stuff. Um, but that like Christ was the opposite. And literally Christ came to like... Um, uh, overcome, overthrow Satan. It's, it's interesting how that's been like flipped on his head. Still, but we're told like humility, turning the other cheek, and all that stuff is, and um, what God has called us to be. There's power in that, but it's been turned on its head. Yeah, Tasha, I don't know what it is when you're speaking. I don't know if you're going closer and further away from the mic, but it's like it drowns out some of what you're saying. So I didn't get the beginning part of what you said, actually. Sorry, I think it's my headphones. Can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, I was just saying, I was going to say that it's, it's like um, it's like Christ. Like, look how he came. He came humble. Um, he preached about turning the other cheek. And it's like the world has turned that on the head. Like the world sees weakness as the things that um, Christ stood for. I just think of an example of like someone getting into a confrontation, the person who backs down or walks away is seen as the weak one. Whereas this is the power according to the word of God. Um, yeah. So just it wasn't that clear, but um, just to confirm what you were saying, and that Christ will teach things like turn the other cheek, and in the world today we'll say you're so weak, you're such a weak person because you turned the other cheek, but actually that strength in the kingdom of God, that's power. It's just like a woman being submissive to her husband in the twenty first century, especially in the West. That you're so weak, you take orders from your husband. But in the scriptures, that's power, that's strength. It takes strength. And the reality is it does. It takes more strength and discipline to be submissive as opposed to retaliating in flesh. It's easy to be angry. Look at all the black people in America getting killed every day. That's easy. That doesn't make you a man. It's easy. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to fight back. It's easy to swear and cuss and hit back. That's easy. That's easy. That's a react. You're just acting of beast nature, like an animal. You're acting like an animal because you just react. You don't. So, um, yeah, I believe that's what Tasha was saying. And Tasha, I think your microphone, according to my understanding of these uh, technology, is it sounds like it has noise cancelling. So if your voice fluctuates in tone, it cuts because every time you stop speaking, it goes completely silent, which is a good thing. But then if you don't, if your tone isn't consistent in terms of your distance from the phone or how loud you're talking, it seems to cut off certain words. So I just wanted to say that for next time you share. Um, yeah, yeah, it's noise sounds like noise cancelling. Um, my one is like that as well. So. It will cut out certain sounds if I don't say them loud enough, Kaylee. Um, it's kind of to what a way too was saying to do with like um the humble were like more of like the prostitutes and the tax collectors, but today how the holy things are the holy sorry, how the holy things are foolishness to this world because the world has become more like into lewdness and into nakedness and stuff like that into like the wickedness so if you become like holy people would laugh at you if you um, i'll just give an example if you want to wear a head covering for god you'll get mocked and stuff and looked down upon and frowned upon if you want to stay at home and be a biblical mother and look after your children people will have something to say or something evil to say about you so yeah that kind of just um, came to mind but i also had um something before um, I can't remember the scripture, I mean the verse, sorry, but it was where Paul says about divisions in the churches, and he says something about, was I the one that was crucified for you? Um, somewhere on the lines there, but it just reminds me of a scripture that I was kind of reading um, yesterday. So, 
and yeah it's somewhere around here let's have a look so now this is this i say that every one of you says i am a paul and i of apollos and if sorry and i of is it theophas and i of christ is christ divided was paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of paul i thank god that i baptized none of you and so yeah so this um, bit just reminds me of um, this scripture that i was reading i think it was yesterday but it's in john 10 and jesus says in the parable he says this and this is verse 16 and other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd so obviously there's no division in the body of christ and how he says that there's only one shepherd and there's only one fold so even if somebody's from a different church or a different like denomination or stuff like that as long as they um are god's sheep this the this we're still like there shouldn't be any division between the body of christ even if they're from a different church a different denomination we should be one in christ because we all got the same spirit so yeah that kind of came to mind it's going to be a kind of add-on just to what katie was saying but i'm going to read the scripture if i can get to it my phone seems to be acting up there we go um now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that you will speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, which I thought was interesting. So we're all meant to speak the same thing in Christ. Um, there shouldn't be any divisions among us. Um, and we should all have the same mind and the same judgment. So um, this is how united we should be, is that we all speak the same, we all think the same, and actually our judgment is meant to be the same, which comes from Christ anyway. Um, because I know a lot of Christians say you shouldn't judge and stuff like that, but even our judgment should be the same. So um, I thought that was interesting. Sorry, can I just add on to that? Because it, cause it just reminds me of Tasha the other day, how she was saying, oh, I don't want to like make your friend look bad, sorry, Tasha, but it just came to mind that how you was telling her, you know, it's adultery to get remarried and these are the righteous judgments that we all should have. And all the body of Christ should be thinking the same, that if you get remarried, it's adultery kind of thing. So, yeah. Praise God. So the scripture says we should be all together in judgment. It's like how we're judging Gaza today or Palestine for their wickedness. We should be even joined together in our agreement of judgment. But today they say, you're not supposed to judge jesus told us not to judge um the scripture tells us to judge righteously and it says that the spiritual judge all things um Ade, did you open your microphone or was that just my uh, my side and if you did you can feel free to share or if not anyone else without judgment there's no justice so it wouldn't even make sense to not be able to judge I also have something else. Um, <clears throat> I'll read the scripture again. Let me just find it. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I don't think it was that, but it was similar to that. So I'm going to have to find it. Mm. Sorry, one sec, I'm just going to find it. So if anyone else wants to speak, you're welcome to. If you don't judge in life anything, it means that the next person, if you're single and a man comes to your door and says, I'm your husband, whether you like it or not, all right, love, I'm your husband, all right? You just have to accept it because you, have, you don't judge. But the reality is we all judge. 
And oftentimes we judge wrong, but the Bible says to judge right. We all have to judge, you understand? If, if you had a family member who was a sodomite and he wanted to come to your house with his boyfriend and sleep together in the bedroom, you're going to have to make a decision. And that decision is going to be a judgment whether you think that's acceptable or not acceptable. If you have a family member who's a sodomite and they want to get married, you're going to judge whether it is fit for you to go to that wedding, celebrate that, that gay marriage, or stay home. Um, Apostle Paul says in, uh, Apostle Peter says in the book of Acts, when they're telling him, listen, you need to close your church and stop preaching. And, uh, and Apostle Peter says, well, judge for yourselves whether you think it's right for us to obey man or obey God. Like in 2020, when every single church had to close down and no one could get baptized, the reality is it, the preachers and ministers should have judged whether it was right to close God's church. Because Jesus says, give to Caesar what's due to Caesar, which is your money and your tax, but give to God which is due to God. Now, the church never belonged to uh, um, Caesar, which represents the government. The church doesn't belong to the government. Therefore, the church don't have right to close, uh, uh, the government don't have right to close the church down. They can close your building down. That's fine. But then you have to have church at home, like we're doing here. They can close your building that belongs to the queen. It belongs to the government. Um, and likewise, who does your body belong to, God or the government? Can someone answer that? God is okay, his so, temple. Amen. So your body is the temple of God. That means if a government forces you to take a particular medication or vaccine, that's now your judgment to say, well, my body doesn't belong to you. You understand? And this is the places where when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is belonging to Caesar, give Caesar his church building. That's fine. Give the government their church building back. Give them that, that, but you don't close the church ever. The church never closes. The building can close. But why did they give their um, churches up? Because they didn't want to be uh, offensive to the government and they didn't want to lose their charity. They didn't want to lose their business. And they remember the government fund the church today. They give you money. So they didn't want to lose that. And so we had a whole bunch of sellout churches in the 2020. Um, but the reality is the church belongs to God. Jesus says, give to God what belongs to God. The church belongs to God. The government have no authority over the church. We see that in scripture. Your body also is the temple of God. Therefore, no one, no government in hell can force you to do anything on your body that you believe will contradict your conscience towards God. Praise God, Nicole. Amen. Very good. <clears throat> Sorry, I found the scripture now. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto Greeks foolishness. And I was thinking this is so true because in the New Testament, in the Gospels, uh, the Jews were always asking for a sign of Jesus, and he wouldn't give them a sign, he said, except for the sign of Jonas. But then, like, when you preach to Gentiles, they think preaching the gospel to them is very foolish, like, they will laugh in your face and stuff like that. And I think, was it in Romans or the book before where Paul was preaching and some of uh, the Romans said to him that he's mad or something like that, he's been reading too much or something like that. I can't remember the scripture, but I was just thinking how true that scripture was, though, that Jews go around seeking for a sign and that uh, the Greeks find it foolish because they're the ones that actually mock and stuff when you preach to them the gospel. Um, and I think there was something else to add on to that. Mm. Yeah, and I think Oetu kind of uh, spoke about it, how, you know, unto the Jews it is a stumbling block. Um, which is true because of their offence in Christ. It's a stumbling block to them coming to God. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting as well. Amen. Pull, the, pull that particular verse up. Anyone else have anything to share? It's 
So let's talk about the Jews and the Gentiles for a second. So the Gentiles at that particular time, let's say Romans, let's say white people, just to make it more contemporary. And I was watching an interview today with, um, I think it was Candice Owens and, and Bill Mayer. I don't know who this guy is, but I think he's an old school comedian. And then I also saw a part of his interview with uh, Jordan Peterson. And the way this guy was talking about God, he was just laughing, right? He was laughing and he was like, all respects to Christians and everything, but don't they think that their book is so stupid? And bear in mind, this is a guy that when he was talking to Candy Sowens, he was saying that you're stupid if you don't believe that men landed on the moon. If you don't believe that men landed on the moon, you're stupid. But then he goes on and says, if you believe the Bible and the stories in there, you're also stupid. And the way he was talking about the Bible, he was saying, you know, it's a foolish book and every once in a while you get wisdom from it. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because that's it. That's what the scripture is saying here. It's saying that um, to the Gentiles, as we see here, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It's the wisdom of this world that turns people away from God. Everything in this chapter, I was talking to my carers about this morning, that there's a statistic, there's a statistic, statistic sorry, that shows you um, and Storm, you can pay attention to this because you're just leaving high school. There's a statistic that shows you that the higher that a person goes in education, the less they believe in God. So the people who were innocently as young, they believed in God, they go to school, they start dwindling a little bit, but not too much. They get to high school, it drops a significant amount. When they get to college, it goes down a lot further. When they get to university, they almost don't believe in God anymore because of everything they're being taught. And then when they go into master's degrees and all the rest of it, they, they become absent in God. And it's very interesting that the more you become educated in this world, the less you can believe in God. The less you believe in God, because why? Because now we have science, now we have planets, now we have Jupiter and Mars, now we have medicine, now we have all these, you know, wisdom from men that the church want to say, oh, you know, don't have faith, you just have to put your trust in Dr. Patel. Um, that's what happens when you become an educated fool. Education turns people into fools in this generation. Now, the Bible says the fool says in their heart that there is no God. Only a fool, F-O-O-L, says that there is no God. Now, what do scientists say? There is no God. The world has been here for six billion years and there were dinosaurs. Only a fool would say that. Who's running the system today? Fools. Who's giving the forecast today? Fools, because they're scientists. I'm not calling them fools to be arrogant. I'm calling them fools because the Bible says anyone who says there is no God is a fool. And that's who teaches us today. The people who teach us today laugh at the idea that you believe in a God. And so as I'm watching this man mocking and scoffing, and it's like he was doing it in an innocent way. It's not like he was trying to be aggravating. He was just like, come on, like, I respect Christians and everything. But you, you have to admit that the stories in this Bible are very stupid. And I'm like, wow, like, yeah, that's real. So when we look at this chapter and we're seeing, um, through wisdom, they didn't know God. Right? The foolishness, uh, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, I want to highlight on this particular verse as well. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. So preaching is foolishness. I don't know if anyone knew that. You see the way we preach, the way I preach, the way I teach, it's foolishness. Okay, it makes sense to you if you're born again. But to the world, it's foolishness. It's noise. They don't want to hear that because it's not. it doesn't sound coherent. We're not using words like H2O and drink these minerals so that you can stop eating meat and save yourself from cancer. We're talking about a message that sounds foolish. Even though it's wise, it sounds foolish to them because it's not in the way that they want it to be presented. So God himself is saying here, it pleased God. God always does this. It says it pleased him to use the foolishness of preaching why do you think God does these things? Saints, come on, let's get our thinking caps on. Why didn't Jesus just come and say, look, everybody, every Muslim, everyone, I'm God, I'm God, worship me. Muslims are always coming with the same question. Where did Jesus say I am God? Jesus doesn't have to say I'm God. You know why? Because he wants people to believe him in faith. Jesus always said, who do you say I am? What do you say I am? Because there's nobody that's going to go to heaven because God forced them and opened the sky and said, I am God, worship me. My name is Allah, worship me. He says... Those who believe, those who have faith will know me. So we know Jesus by faith. And so God is very strategic. I just want everyone to pay attention to that. He uses something. He could, in other words, what I'm trying to say, 
God could have made this thing fancy, educational, philosophical, scientific, to the point where everyone be like, okay, yeah, yeah, we get it, we get it. The Bible's real, yeah, we get it, because it makes sense to our carnal imaginations. But God deliberately uses a strategy that makes it look foolish. You know why? Because we know why. We've been reading it in Romans, because he deliberately wants to blind the people who are arrogant. He deliberately wants to close the eyes of people who don't want to humble themselves and therefore they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because they're too busy um, looking for it in the way that they expect. God don't have to bend to you. God don't have to bow down to you and give it to you in the way that you make sense. It don't matter if it makes sense to you. If you're a child of God, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they listen. He don't have to bend over for you. He ain't bending over for no one. Right, so the verse 22 says, for the Jews require a sign. This is the same today. And the white people seek after wisdom. I'm just going to use the word white people for um, Greeks, okay? Uh, white people seek wisdom. It's the same today. When you talk to a white Westerner today about God, it's like, oh, well, do you have any statistics? Do you have any proof of that? They deal with evidence. Uh, um, but Jewish people, they're not really so much into the evidence or this um, wisdom, so to speak. But the Jewish people want to see power. This is giving us the strategy of how to preach to a Jew. Don't go to, to Jerusalem with your fancy words. They're not interested. They want to see the demonstration of power. That's how you convert a Jew. Show them the miraculous power of God. They ain't interested in your cute words. Jews ain't interested. It says here, the Jews require, not just that they want, require a sign. Show them a sign. Then they'll say, even the Pharisees believe Jesus because of his miracles. They want to see a sign. The Greeks now, on the other hand, they want to see philosophical wisdom and evidence and all these one hour arguments proving God is real because of so and so and so. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. It's an offense, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, it is absolute foolishness. But unto them which are called, chosen, both from the Jews and the Greeks, is the power of God. So those of us, whether you're white, whether you're Greek, whether you're Jew, if we're chosen and called, it's now the power of God. Okay, because the wisdom, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Apostle uh, uh, Oetu earlier uh, um, said, you know, what's the weakness of God? Does God have a weakness? God's only weakness is man. Okay, we are his weakness because the scripture here says the weakness of God is stronger than men. How can God have a weakness? He doesn't, but his weakness is man. How does that make sense? The same way that when a man joins to a woman and she becomes his weakness because she's one flesh, Jesus joins with us, the church, and we become his flesh, so we become his weakness because we're literally joined to Christ. So when we stumble or make mistakes, that's a part of him which makes us his weakness, and that's how God gets a weakness. Um, there was actually a few things. There's so many things in this chapter. Uh, I want to see if there's a couple more things I wanted, uh, I'm able to. Oh, yeah, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how, listen to this, and I was talking to my carers about this this morning, how that not many wise men after the flesh and not many mighty and noble are called. This is saying, saints, the Apostle Paul saying, can you see your calling, brethren? Can you see this? Can you see this fact? Not many wise people are called. Not many philosophers, scientists, and educated people are called. I just said, the more educated people get in this world, the more they, they don't believe in God. It says, not many wise people are called after the flesh, and not many strong, and not many noble, as in the princes, the high people of this world, are called. Who did God choose then? 27. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Praise God for all of the foolish things that God has used, because I'm one of them. I'm one of the foolish things that God has used. Amen. And any of us who was pulled out of a life of foolishness, like I was living in foolishness and God chose to use me. And it says not many of the wise and all the people with degrees and master's degrees. That's cute. But that's not the people that God's going for because he's looking for people because it actually goes on to explain. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to confront or confound the things that are mighty and the base things, the things that are underneath in this world and things which are despised. The people that are despised and forgotten like David when he was in the back of his garden and no one cared when David was there and, and Samuel was like, listen, God told me one of your sons is the king. And you're showing me all these muscly, oily chested sons who are all educated. And, and I'm like, no, nah, it's not them. It's not that. And then all of a sudden he's like, do you have another son? He's like, yeah, yeah, David. David's cleaning sheep poo in the garden. He's looking after the poo. He's cleaning poo. 
And Samuel was like, yeah, that's the king. That's the one I caught. The foolish things of this world. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is choosing the foolish person, not the people that look good and talk good and all the rest of that. God's choosing the foolish people, right? Um, to bring to now, uh, um, um, despise God has chosen and things which are not to bring to nothing them which are. So in fact, he's using the foolish people to make the wise people look foolish. That's what this is all saying, this whole chapter. He uses the foolish people. Remember what they said to Peter and James in, in the book of Acts. Who is these uneducated men and how do they have so much power? That draws attention. I mean, if you have 10 master's degrees, people are like, oh yeah, you can say it's God, but it's because you have 10 degrees. That's why you're smart. But then when God chooses a fisher who doesn't even know how to read, a fisherman, right? Then all of a sudden it's like, how come you have so much boldness? How come, what do you, what's your, where's your bank, what's your bank account? Why are you bold? Because God chooses the foolish people to make the wise people foolish. And then it says in verse 29, which is key, that so, the reason he does all of this, right, is so that no one can boast. The word glory just means boast. No one can boast in his presence. How, what does that mean? So if I have 10 master's degrees and God uses you and God uses me to do something, I can say, oh, yeah, you know, thank God. But also thank my university professor from Harvard and Cambridge and Oxford. Thank you, all of you. God as well. Thanks, God as well. I remember you, God. But when it's somebody who was only trained by God, who's a foolish person, that person is going to be like, listen, the only reason I'm able to stand here today and speak to you today is because of what Jesus done in my life. And that's the reason God uses the foolish things of this world. There was a couple more things, but let me let Kaylee speak and anyone else. Praise God. Um, so, so what just came to mind was, remember that, um, I can't remember his name, but he was born blind and people thinking that it was, he was like, it's because his he sinned or it was his parents that sinned. But when God, when Jesus obviously put the mud, um, the clay over his eyes and told him to wash. And obviously he was born blind. So he, I don't know how old he was, but anyway, for, since, he, since from birth, he was obviously blind. And then obviously when Jesus obviously anointed his eyes and he was able to see, he was sent to the people that was supposed to be, um, he was uh, physically blind, but then he was sent to people that were spiritually blind. So God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So they thought that he was uh, born in sin. I think it was the Pharisees as well, not just the disciples, but the Pharisees thought um, he was born in sin. And God used him to minister to the Pharisees, which were spiritually blind, and how he was actually physically blind. But then God gave him the anointing to go to these people to tell them about Jesus. And they couldn't believe that he was actually born blind. They, they actually went and sent to the parents to check to see if he was obviously born blind. And then when the parents confirmed it, then they realised, OK, it, you know, they tried to deflect the glory from Jesus. They all give glory to God instead. But yeah, um, it just reminded me of that situation anyway. And just before Nicole as well, because that's a good example, actually, when I saw where you took it, because that example, when they, the Pharisees took him into the temple and said, wait a second, you was born blind. And now this blind man who doesn't know anything, he's saying to them, it's Jesus, like, it's the Messiah. He's the one. He's the one that uncovered my eyes, you know, or he didn't know who he was, but he's saying, but this man, clearly, there's something about him. And the Pharisees responded to him, who do you think you are? Who are you talking to, you uneducated fool? So it's just a good example, because that's exactly how they spoke to him. You uneducated fool, who do you think you are to tell us, get out of this temple? Because God always chooses the uneducated fools or the foolish things of this world. And this doesn't mean, of course, that we're saying, oh, do everything you can to be uneducated. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, we don't put our trust in that. You know what I mean? If you've got the degree, you've got the education, that's fine. But what did Apostle Paul say? I'm educated, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a tribe of Benjamin, but I put all of that in the trash, in the bin for the sake of knowing Christ. So what's your values on? Which one do you love more? Your status, your accolades, your title? Or do you love the fact that you know Jesus and have a relationship? Which one is more important? Which one would you give up today? Would you give up your riches and your education? Or would you give up Christ? And believe me, many people will give up Christ before they give up their riches and education, Nicole. It was just making me think really how it's by our foolishness in God, obviously, with his wisdom that we're able to confound the wise. And it was making me think about how a lot of these preachers and YouTubers, um, 
make a lot of their sermons or teachings on trying to sound wise in a worldly way um, and they do it according to worldly wisdom and you can kind of see how that makes it easy for the unbelievers to kind of like smash them down and humiliate them in whether it would come to like a debate or something um, they could easily be humiliated by a non-believer because it's like they try to win the world by trying to be like the world and it just doesn't work so in a way it's just encouraging to know that it's actually by our foolishness and not trying to be like the world and not trying to be wise like them that we can actually confound them because God will give us his wisdom you know he will take someone that's considered foolish and he'll give us his wisdom that will confound the wise so um it, it was just a thought but it was kind of like an encouraging thought that we don't have to try and be like the world and we don't have to try and be wise like the world or you know try and use their wisdom like a lot of these youtubers and youtube that try and mix their doctrine with the world and just compromise it and try to accommodate the world um but actually god even in whether that's infirmities or whether we have a lack lack of speech or whatever it is that god can even in that use that um and what he has given us to confound the wisdom of this world and to make the wisdom of this world look foolish as well and then pull the chapter up again then we'll get ready to move on does anyone else have anything to share to share remember if you have anything that is a blessing if you have a question that might be somebody else's question um nothing is too small to say uh make sure that you release off of your thoughts what you want to say praise god we're not in a rush in that regard at all um but obviously at the same time if there's genuinely you feel like you have nothing to say then we will move forward um so a few more minutes i'd pull it up to the top of the chapter around verse 12 as well and anyone if you have anything to say then share <laughs> That so that was another one. Now I say unto everyone, I am Paul, or, or sorry. Now this I say that every one of you that says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am a Methodist, and I am a Baptist, and I am a Catholic, and I am an Orthodox, and I am a Pentecostal. This is where we get denominations from. He's saying every one of you that says, I am of Paul, and I am Apostle, uh, uh, Apollos, sorry, and I am a Cephas, and I am of Christ, and he's like. In 13, is Christ divided? That's the question to the denominations today. Or oh, I'm a Methodist and I'm a Baptist and I'm an Adventist. Or oh, is Christ divided? Did his body split? Is he split? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was you baptized in the name of Paul? Or Apollos or Cephas? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, lest any of you should say that I baptize in my own name. So Paul's saying, I'm so glad I didn't even baptize you because the way you guys are making factions, oh, I'm, well, I'm a follower of Paul. Well, I'm a follower of Timothy. Well, I'm a follower of Peter. Well, I'm a follower of James. No, it doesn't work like that. We're all followers of Christ. Yes, there's teachers and leaders, but they're not the, the, the markers for the faith. It's Christ who died. Paul didn't die for you. The Methodist church founder didn't die for you, John Wesley. He didn't die for you. The priest didn't die for you. These, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Constantine, the lead, the founder of the Catholic church, didn't die for anyone. He yeah, understand. But yet we're here today holding on to these different divisions. And Paul saying, is the church divided? Praise God. Um, and then just pull it up to the, to the top of the page and then uh, go down a bit. If anyone has anything to say, please jump in. Because I just wanted to make sure there was nothing else in. I was just going to say, it's so typical for people to run after, like, the the product, the fleshly thing, instead of doing the work and chasing God. It just shows a lack of faith. Because, like, you see Paul, you see whoever, you see all these people. So it's easy for people to be like, you know what? Yeah, I've seen them so I can follow them. But instead of having the faith to believe, you know what? Who is the one that sent them? Like it takes, um, if that makes sense, it takes so much more faith for you to um, go to the source. It's so easy to, to go to the, the product. Um, there's such human nature. 
it's so easy to go to the prophet who's doing miracles in Wembley instead of reading the Bible for yourself. Exactly that. Secondhand, secondhand gospel. Hey Amen. There was some more things, but it's okay. You know, we're always going to be able to talk about these things. So let's move on to the next chapter for the sake of time. All right. So, um, Tia, do you want me to read and then you read and then I'll read the last one? What do you think? Or do you want to read two? I don't mind, you know. It's up to you. you want, um, I don't mind as well. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll read and then you read and then I'll read. Um, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. So a continuation here. I didn't come with excellent speech, okay, or wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Let's just start there. I, Apostle Paul, didn't come to you with perfect speech. Not that he couldn't speak, because he was actually the educated one. But he's like, I didn't come to you with speech or fancy words declaring unto you the testimony of God. Uh, verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Apostle Paul deliberately didn't come to them trying to sound smart, as Nicole was mentioning, or educated, because he wanted them to realize I'm standing here in the name of Christ, not in my own name or accolades or education. I just want you to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. Everything else is irrelevant. Verse 3, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Apostle Paul, mighty Apostle Paul, miracle working Apostle Paul. He says, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. He's being vulnerable. Praise God. He's being vulnerable. He's being open. He was fearful at times. He was trembling at times. Uh, verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. What did he come with? But in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. I didn't come with enticing words, seductive words, motivational speeches, but I came with the demonstration of the spirit and power. That's what is the proof or the evidence of a minister of God. Not cute words, which is a good thing. It's good to be able to speak as a gift, but that's not what de defines you actually or, or validates you. He says, I came with the demonstration of the spirit. Where's your power is what we have to ask. You can have all these nice words, but where's the power? Because if you're walking with Christ, you have power. Verse five, that your faith, and the reason he did it, context, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So all of that he just said is so that you don't put your faith in his wisdom, but you put it in the power of God. Six, how be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing. Remember, Satan is also a prince of this world. But we speak in the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a mystery, uh, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. So Apostle Paul said, I'm speaking not in the wisdom of this world, the way that the world teaches you to be wise in education, etc., philosophy, but I'm speaking to you in a wisdom of God that has been revealed. It was hidden. Now it's being revealed. It's ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. And if they did know, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. So you see, if they, they're so foolish in their wisdom, that if they knew what would happen when they crucified Jesus, that the whole world would be set free, they would have never crucified him. That's what he's saying there. Because if they knew it, they would never crucify Jesus. If Satan himself knew that Jesus' death was going to be the beginning of the power of the church, he wouldn't crucify him. Satan actually thought he was destroying Jesus. He's so dumb. They thought that they were actually doing something against God, but that was God's plan. And they couldn't see it because it was hidden wisdom. Um, but as it is written, no eye has seen and no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. <laughs> so you see, the scripture says, no eye has seen and no ear has heard, and it hasn't even entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those people that love him. But then it goes in verse 10, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. So you see right there, 
even the Old Testament said, nobody's heard it, nobody's seen it, it's all a mystery. But in verse 10, in the New Covenant says, listen, but now it's been revealed. Praise God. There's no more mystery. The mystery has been revealed. Amen. Uh, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yet the deep things of God. Verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Who knows a man except his spirit that is in him? Who knows a woman except the spirit that is in her? Even so, the things of God know if not us. We don't know the things of God, but the spirit of God. So the same way no one knows a, a human or a man or a woman except the spirit that lives inside of you, because we all have a spirit. It's saying, likewise, no one knows God except the spirit of God that lives in him. And so how do, we know this, how do we know God? By the spirit that he's given to us that searches all things. It's by the spirit of God that we know God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. See, so the world has a spirit. We haven't received the spirit of the world, but we've, a spirit, we've received the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teach. Again, the emphasis on we're not speaking with wisdom of men that sound great and sound cute, but the spirit of God, what he speaks and what he teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. This is when you're speaking on a spiritual level. Guess what it says in verse 14? The natural man, the carnal man or the carnal woman cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness unto them. Okay? How many people have you spoken to about Jesus? And for them it's foolishness because they are carnal. The natural man cannot receive the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. Praise God. So the Bible prepared us already that people are going to think that what you're saying is foolishness. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. It's not possible for a natural man to know these things. Then it goes on to give why, the context, because they are spiritually discerned. So to understand the Bible has to be done spiritually. It's not by the imagination of your mind. Um, but he that is spiritual, what does it say here? Judges all things. The person who is spiritual judges all things. But Christians are not supposed to judge. Judges all things. But God is love. But he that is spiritual judges all things. So when you're spiritual, you do judge. You don't condemn. There is a difference. You don't put people down and make yourself better than them because you're not. We're not better than anyone. But you judge right from wrong. Praise God. 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Listen again. Who has known the mind or the mystery of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we, praise the Lord, the saints, the born again saints, the sanctified saints, we have the mind of Christ. Guess what that means? That means when you get that thought that comes to your mind, that's the mind of Christ if you have Christ in you. You're not just thinking, oh, I want to eat, drink coconut milk today, coconut juice. That's the mind of Christ. You know, God can even adjust the food intake that you have. Not the, I'm not talking about the natural way where you go on YouTube and find all the good foods that you should eat. The Spirit of God, if he wanted you to eat a particular food, he will tell you. God told me before to drink coconut water. And then a woman of God came to my house and gave a prophetic word. And she said to me, God is saying to me to tell you coconut. And I don't know what it means. I'm seeing a vision of a coconut being split. And then I told her what it meant. And my mom was there as a witness because I had already told my mom the word. God wanted me to drink coconut water. I don't know why. I don't take medication. Maybe it was beneficial at that time. I don't know why, but I took it. And since then, I drank coconut water for the next three, four months after that. Because God told me I didn't actually know the effects. I didn't feel anything, but it was a revelation. God himself can tell you what food to eat, what not to eat. You don't have to go on Google and search YouTube to find out what these carnal people are giving you in their human wisdom. Because my mom went that route and she took advice from these people that said, stop eating meat and your cancer will go. She stopped eating meat and she died. You understand? We don't have to take wisdom from men, but the, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to wear. He will tell you what to eat. You just have to be sensitive to him. Amen. floors open everyone let's jump to it so that we can try our best to finish by um 11.
Go ahead, Katie. I'm sorry, I really don't know where the verse is for this one, but um, basically uh, where Paul says he didn't come with enticing words, but he basically uh, came with the uh, power of God. Um, that verse. But basically it just reminded me of David. He came with um, power and not with the wisdom of men. So in faith, in God when he came in the power of God to take out Goliath. To the world it would have uh, seen it as foolish. I don't think I finished with writing that one, but basically it's just that um, he didn't come with like the wisdom of man, but he just demonstrated the power of God when he took out Goliath. And then um, um, Corinthians to 11 to 12 so that verse reminded me of um, the disciples when Jesus was going to die and he was just speaking to them and he said to them that he was going to send a comforter unto them which shall reveal to them all things because at that time they couldn't understand what he was saying because he was speaking to them in parables but he says, when the comforter comes unto you, he will reveal kind of like all things. And that's the same way you have the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will reveal to us the things of God. Amen. Anyone else? just there again where it says we speak the wisdom of god verse seven even the hidden wisdom you see there's some things even today in the church i've heard a minister one time years ago say who do you think you are that god tells you something that you didn't tell the rest of us yeah he does he does he tells some of us things that he doesn't tell everybody else he really does i think that's clear today um he tells some of us things that he doesn't tell everyone and it says here the hidden wisdom you see the closer you get to god um the more he's going to reveal his secrets to you if you have a friend or a family member which one of them are you going to share your secrets to which one of you going to uh, which one of them are you going to say listen i have um, some diamonds stashed underneath my floorboard i have some gold under my god which one are you going to tell every all of your friends i don't think so but you're going to tell the friend that is the closest to you or the closest ones the ones that you trust god trusts many of us with hidden wisdom Okay, and that's what revelation is. It's hidden wisdom that it's not written on the paper in that way, but it's revealed and then it makes sense to those who have the Spirit of God. And there's many preachers out here that have been here for 20, 30 years and they don't get the hidden mysteries. And so that's why when certain things happen, like a pandemic, they don't know what to do. Should we buy tissue? Should we buy sanitizer? Should we lock ourselves in the house? Should we fly to what They don't know because the hidden mysteries hasn't been revealed to them. And so they're confused just like the rest of the world. But we shouldn't be confused. We should be in alignment and God should be directing our steps. The believer should not be in confusion because the Bible says God has not given you the spirit of confusion. And even now as I'm speaking, I break the power of confusion in Jesus' name. I break the power of confusion. Even now, the power of confusion over anyone's mind is broken. Just now it's broken. Right now it's broken because this is how this Holy Spirit fell on the people when Apostle Peter was speaking. Right now, the spirit of confusion was just broken over anyone's mind. The spirit of confusion was broken. In Jesus' name, amen, Nicole. It was just making me think about how Jesus spoke unto the multitude in parables so that they would not understand. So he did it deliberately so that they would not understand. But with his disciples, he revealed it unto them um, and gave them revelation. And he said it was for them to know the mysteries. Um, but unto the multitude, he purposely spoke in parables so they could not understand. So even in the church, there are certain people that God won't reveal things to them because he doesn't want them to know. And then as you were saying, those that were that are closer to God, like the disciples were closer to Jesus than what the multitude was, um, to them God will reveal it. Um, so yeah, very important to have that closeness and relationship with God if we do want to know him. Praise God. Let's go to the next chapter. 
and uh, just came to me to share just now. As I was just speaking and I said the spirit of confusion is broken, I'm encouraging everyone, praise the Lord, and storm comes to mind, praise the Lord, that childlike faith, okay? When I'm speaking and I say the spirit of confusion is broken, it's broken because I said it in faith. And I want everyone to understand that power that we have in, in, in Christ. Um, as Apostle Paul's talking about, this isn't words, this is power. This Bible study is not just cute words on a paper. This is deliverance right now. This is freedom right now. This is the breaking of curses right now. This is the breaking of confusion. And so as I was speaking, that's what I saw. I saw that the spirit of confusion was being broken, so I released it. Sometimes God has a word that he wants to release randomly, and you have to be obedient, and you just have to say it. This is what childlike faith, faith, childlike faith is. It's foolishness. It sounds foolish sometimes when you go with what God wants, but you just get used to it. And maybe that's a word more to storm. Um, but storm, I just want to encourage you that when God gives you something and it looks foolish or it sounds foolish, believe me, and I believe God really wants to use you in that way because of your childlike faith and because of your youth and because of your innocence. I believe God's going to speak to you. And I've, I've been meaning to, I've had this on my mind and it's maybe just being released now, but concerning storm, um, there's a way that God's going to use you because of your incorrupted nature and your innocence. God has an access to your mind and you just have to release it. Don't question those thoughts when they come to you. Just release it. Just accept it. Just believe it. And that's childlike faith. You don't have to be confused about it or unsure when you're at school, when you're wherever you are, with whoever you're with. There's certain times God's going to use your words to break curses in an instance. He's going to use you in a mighty way, in a powerful way. All you have to do is be available to be used and be ready to be used. Amen. Did you get that song? Let's go to the next chapter. And then Tia can go ahead. I'm wondering whether she's falling asleep. <laughs> remind her of that word when, if she did, remind her of that word. Yeah, I will. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we as for we are labourers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builder buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye that not, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. 
If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is writ written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God, is God's. Um, I remember, this, this literally reminds me of the night that um, Ta my sister Tasha got saved, because me and Storm were literally reading this very chapter, and um, we were just reminded how, like, where it says about, um, the one that plants the seed and the one that waters but it's God that gives the increase and that really was like speaking to us because it's like that saying where you know you can lead the horse to water but you can't make it drink and it was like you know everything that me and Storm were doing in Tasha's life you know at the end of the day it, it, it was only God that could have really um brought it upon her to really like give her whole self over to him you know to drink the water basically but um obviously we know that as laborers in Christ you know we're to be, be the planters we're to be the waterers we're to do all these things um and that is just our part of um of you know ministering basically but it's like it's like a good reminder as well because I know some people can sometimes be in the mindset of thinking that it's down to them to save a person but then obviously there is that side of it where you know we're to you know lead them to Christ but it's down to that person to fully accept him so I know there's people that can also overburden themselves or even try and put themselves in the position of Jesus basically and almost coming across like they're the, the person saviour when they're not and I think that also takes a lot of burden or, and, and pressure off that of that person as well when you know that you know what God has called you in and you know the um, position that we have in Christ and the fact that at the end of the day it's Jesus that saves so and um there was another thing as well um, about the foundations and just how, like, even in, in my own life, how I've seen how, you know, when you build on build a foundation on anything that is not of, of God, how it just crumbles and how even the effect of, the, the effect on you spiritually, even of building something that is not on Christ. But then it's like, like even what what the what the scriptures are saying about it would be tested by fire, and even obviously that that's in the end days, but also even in the everyday life that we see the um the fruits of our labors, and you know when you're not when you're not walking in Christ, you know, and you're not like building in Christ as well, how that only ever brings forth the bad fruit, um. But when you're building a house on Christ and it's solid, then it's only going to bring forth um, those blessings and bring forth the good fruit. Um, there was something else as well, but I've forgotten. It'll, it'll come back to me. I was going to say regarding what you're talking about, um, one person waters that scripture, I think verse 6 or 7, it just reminded me of the scripture that we, although we are one body, we have different roles. So we can't all just be one thing. We all have our plant in. One person sows the seed, the other person waters it. And God allows it to increase. So we all work together. So not to be discouraged if you are sowing into someone or if you're watering someone and you're not seeing any results. Um, because as you said, like, don't be burdened with that. It's not us who are going to save people. We just do a part. And the chain continues. Amen. Just capitalizing what Tia said earlier, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink. You can lead someone to the truth, you can't make them accept it. You can't make them repent. 
And so we are not saviors. We are not Jesus. We can only give what has been given to us freely, but we cannot expect or demand results. And even when somebody's planting in a garden, they can't expect or demand that this plant has to grow at this speed or we have to see it. Actually, you could water a plant for years or water a, a gr the ground for years. And it's only at a particular time when you begin to see in the summer when those plants begin to come out of the ground and you're like, wow, that's something I planted three years ago and now it's coming. So um, planting or uh, apostles plant and the ministers water, you know, there's going to be results. We don't necessarily have to see those results. Amen. Nicole. I'm just going to read the scripture. Um, now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And it was making me think of, do you know, as um, the word talks about gold, like being like refined gold, and when you put gold in the fire, um, it becomes purified and refined. Um, so I was thinking, you know, if, if a man's work is made out of gold, when it goes through the fire and is tried, it will come out as pure gold. But I was thinking if a man's work is made out of like hay, wood and stubble, that's just going to burn up in the fire. <laughs> So, yeah, it was just like an analogy going off in my mind when I was reading that piece of scripture of how if you're like gold or silver, that can kind of become refined. But wood, hay, stubble will just burn up in the fire. So, um, sorry, was that somebody speaking? So, yeah, it was just that really. I was going to land it on something, but I just got distracted and forgot. But, yeah, I thought that was quite interesting how you know our work will be tested by fire and i think what kind of i don't want to say the word quality but what kind of i guess quality because that's the best word i can think of of what your work is when it's tested by the fire you shall see what results you'll get out of it whether it will burn up or whether it'll become refined as a like pure gold very good kelly I was just thinking it's more of a question to was what Nicole was saying to do with like the gold and the silver, you know, if it burns, you know, it becomes purified. And I was thinking, you know, through trials and stuff, if somebody's like, let's say it's like hay and wood, uh, would that kind of like make them fall away kind of thing, like a sign of like a fall away? But those that are like rooted like gold and silver, would that be like they'll bear like more fruit out of it? I think it says it in the scripture because um, after that it says if any man's work shall be burnt he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire so um, I think because it's talking about the work of a person but I guess uh, Juca can confirm I can bring the scripture up as well Yeah, yeah, I was going to touch on that scripture anyway, and then we'll move to the last and then we'll close up. Um, so, good question. When a person's work is burned up on judgment day, what does it look like? So, verse now uh, 12. Now, if any man builds upon a foundation of gold and silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, praise the Lord. This is the thing, right? This is this when the scriptures talk, they speak about future and they speak about now. Even now, every one of you saints have to be tested by fire. What's the fire that you're being tested by today? Because every believer has suffering. Every believer has something that they have to go through, which is a test and a trial. Whether you've gone through it yet or not, you have to. So that's something to look forward to, amen. 
Now it says, because it shall be revealed by fire. So your work and your life in Christ shall be revealed by fire. Fire is the tester whether what you're doing is from God or if it's not of God. Then it goes on to say, and the fire shall try every man's work of what kind of work it is. Okay, Verse 14, if any man's work abides which he has built, he shall receive a reward. So after God brings the fire, talking about on judgment day, God brings fire to test what you've done. And if your work can stand through his fire, then you will be rewarded. But if your YouTube channel shall be burned, you shall suffer loss. And so I was just thinking YouTube channel just as an example. And that's not to say everybody's because I don't believe David Lin, David's Lynn would, David Lynn's would. But just as an example of the fickle ministries that we have today where people just sit behind a camera with their boxer shorts and a shirt and tie. And they say that this is, you know, the, the work of the Lord. A lot of it isn't the work of the Lord. And so what it says in 15 is any man's work shall be burned. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. This is encouraging and discouraging into it, in it, both at the same time, because this scripture, praise the Lord, is actually saying there's many Christians who, when they go to Jesus at the end, he's going to burn your works like trash, but you're still going to be saved. So amen, there's a category of Christians that even if you didn't do everything God told you to do or you didn't do it the right way, you're still going to be saved. I don't know if they're going to get well done, but they're going to get in. Like in university, when you get the 2-1 master or 2-0 or, or, or just pass, um, there's different grades that you get. So the person like Nicole said, whose work is established on gold, they're going to receive reward. Jesus is going to say, well done, your work is purified. But the people that built just YouTube channels or your ministry, I don't know, I'm trying to think of fickle ministries that aren't really ministries. Um, the people that basically, or even businesses that you've established on this earth, that you took all your you know, energy and time into creating this business um, and Jesus didn't ask you to do that. That would be another example. Doing things on this earth that Jesus didn't ask you to do. And you're like, yeah, I'm the most successful cake baker in the West. And it's like, okay, cool. But did Jesus ask you to be a cake baker in the West? You know what I mean? What is it that Jesus asks you to do? And, and when you bring that business to God, is he going to say, well done. I'm so proud of your business of making Christmas trees. Or is he going to say, this is trash and I'm going to burn it. So, so I'm, not, I'm just pinpointing different examples. I'm sure there's many examples of anything. You could be a cigarette maker and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian and I make cigarettes for a living. Cool. But your work is going to be burned. So but at the same time, he's also saying this person will still be saved. Now, bear in mind, there's some, some believers that the scripture says will not be saved because they weren't even in relationship with Jesus. But this specific scripture is talking about Christians who will be saved. You're still going to go to heaven. You're still going to be in the kingdom, but you're not going to have any reward because everything you did on earth was in vain. So that's a very interesting one that maybe we need to speak about more um, at some point. But yes, there's a category of believers that are going to make it to heaven, but your work is like, I don't have any work because it was all a waste of work, while others will be rewarded because what they did is what Jesus told them to do. But you will still be saved, which is still um, something to be glad about anyway. But the point is, we don't want to give Jesus our work at the end and he said nah you know it's going to be burned up because it's no good to me let's make sure then that we're doing what God called us to do instead of doing you know building houses on the sand amen any other thoughts before we go to the next chapter Nicole <clears throat> what you were saying was just reminding me that there's going to be those Christians that would just scrape in and I'm wondering whether it's like they're in alignment with the with the scripture that we just read because um, it does talk about there's going to be certain people that would just kind of scrape into the kingdom of God. Amen. There'll be many believers, which none of us want to be, by the way, that you just made it. You just made it by one mark. You just made it into your next university. Uh, you just graduated by one mark. And it's like, cool, I got in. Praise the Lord. Thank you. But we don't need to do that, you know what I mean? We don't need to depend on that one mark to get in. Amen. Um, let's go to the last chapter. If no one has anything to say, then I'll try and go for it quick and we'll finish. <clears throat> okay, listen. Uh, verse 1. Let, no, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Okay? We are ministers of Christ and we're stewards of the mysteries. Okay? We carry the mysteries. 
moreover it's required it, it moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful so the requirement to actually be a minister or a steward of the mysteries is that you have to be faithful you can't be living in disorder amen but with me it is a very small thing that i should be judged of you or of man's judgment yeah i do not even judge my own self verse 4 for i know nothing by myself yet i am not hereby justified but he that judges me is the lord jesus judges me therefore judge nothing before the time until the lord comes who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of god i've fallen victim to this in the past where i've judged things before their time discerned things and revealed it before its time thinking that i was doing the right thing in that moment but can create certain fallaways and offenses that were not necessarily necessary if i had just waited because jesus has always been something i've challenged myself with that i don't want to be around judas okay if a judas came into this group i don't want them personally that's me being honest i don't want judas in my team i don't want it but yet Jesus had Judas in his team and still treated him with equality. I don't want a Judas, but that's something I have to work on because sometimes God wants to put a Judas in your life and you have to deal with that. And it probably keeps you humble and, and you don't reveal it to anyone until it reveals itself. And sometimes as the scripture is saying, that's going to be in the end. That's not in every case, but in some cases you are supposed to just leave it so that God can do what he wants to do with the Judas. Okay. Sometimes God will put a Judas around you, a betraying person around you. Um, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself, okay, and to Apollos for you. Hold on, did I jump there? Yeah, I think I jumped in there. Uh, therefore, judge nothing before it's time. That is by the first counsel of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Uh, no, yes, yeah, fine. Verse 6, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for um, for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you will be puffed up one against another, right? Don't think of yourselves and don't look at people with certain accolades and try and, you know, you make them be puffed up. And arrogant i'm dr so and so i'm dr sabia i'm dr pagan um so that you be puffed up towards one another uh, for who makes thee to differ one from another and has and what have you that you that that you didn't receive you know who makes you better than another person and what have you got that you didn't receive from god now if you received it why are you boasting as if you didn't receive it. How are you boasting, saying that I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I'm an apostle, when it's a gift that God gave you is what the scripture is saying. How can you be boasting when it's a gift that God gave you? How can Adam boast and say, look at my trees, look at my garden, look at my tree of knowledge, look how pretty it is, look at the tree. But he, he, didn't, he didn't create that. God gave it to him. It was a gift. You know. Um, now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us, okay? And I would to God, you did reign. I'm happy that you're reigning. I'm happy that you're ruling, that we also might reign with you. So Apostle Paul saying, some of you are puffed up. You're out there. You're probably big and famous in this world right now. You're reigning like kings without us. But he's saying, I'm happy for you. I'm glad that you're reigning so that we can reign with you. It's more influence for us. Uh, for I think that God has set forth us apostles uh, last as it were appointed to death for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men so he's talking about people in the church that are successful you're big yeah you're out there you're ruling you're governing you're probably the mayor of your town he's like i'm happy for you but as for us apostles we're at the bottom appointed to death to dive so you see there's a category here of believers again who are out there and they're probably called to be up there in the ranks and be respected in some regard but then the apostles are the spectacles that people mock and scoff because they don't have that entitlement. Um, that's good. We are made a spectacle unto world and to the angels and to men, even to the angels. They're looking at us like, what? Um, we are fools for Christ's sake. Praise God. 
we're fools for Christ's sakes. But you're wise. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the other Christians in the church that are maybe educated, maybe wise, maybe on top, maybe getting respect from the government. You're wise. We're foolish, but you're wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You're honorable, but no one respects me. You're honorable, Apostle Paul's saying, but no one respects us. They respect you, but they don't respect us. So there's different categories of Christians in the church. We can't despise people just because they're rich or successful and things like that. There's some people that are called to that. Um, even onto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. We don't even know where we're going to be living tonight. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, disgraced, we've, we blessed, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat it. We are made as the filth of the world, oh Lord. We are made to look like the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Praise God. Not every single person is called to that, but many are called and few are chosen. Verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, praise the Lord, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Amen. Uh, where it pulls humble in them here you see it like you got 10,000 instructors but not many fathers I've begotten you in the gospel I think at this point he's not bragging he's just trying to humble them because he sounds like he's talking to a bunch of people who are puffed up wherefore I beseech you do, do, be followers of me for this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus who is my beloved son Timothy and faithful in the Lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in christ as i teach everywhere in every church isn't that just a confirmation tasha praise the lord as i teach everywhere in every church the same doctrine verse 18 now some are puffed up as though i would not come to you, you see i love this today's bible study because it seems like everything we talk about gets confirmed in the next chapter or the next scripture now, some of you are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, um, but the power. You see that there? I'm going to get back to that. For the kingdom of God is not in words. It's not about your words. It's in your power. This is everything we've been talking. This is what today's Bible study has been about. The kingdom of God is not in your words, but in power. What will you? Should I come unto you with a rod or in, let me pause there. So now some of you are puffed up as if I'm not going to come to you. And I will come to you shortly, praise the Lord, if the Lord wills for me to come to you. And I'm going to know not the speech of those that are bragging and boasting, but I'm going to know your power. Because you're talking big, but do you have power? You're talking the most, but do you, what's the power and the evidence in your life? Um, verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in words, but it's in power. So the kingdom of God on any individual is not about what you know or can say. What's the demonstration in your life where you are carrying that power or authority? Okay? Because that word power means authority in this particular context. What will you, shall I, actually it could mean exousia. Um, Tasha could confirm that later. What will you, um, shall I come unto you with a rod or in love? and in the spirit of meekness so should i come to you to beat your backside or should i come to you with love and the spirit of meekness amen so i don't have a lot to say because i feel like these chapters today was really about the same topic and they were literally talking about the same thing repetition was the key tonight amen what did you want me to check sorry Trooper. So the word where it says the kingdom of God is not in words, but power. Is that word exousia or is that word dunamis? Dunamis. Dunamis. So the kingdom of God is in dynamite. So dunamis is where the word dynamite comes from, which is dynamite power, like an explosive bomb. And so what that scripture is saying is that the kingdom of God is not about what you're saying. What you say is good, but what you say has to be backed 
by dunamis. Dunamis power is when Jesus said to the disciples, wait in the upper room, don't go anywhere until the dunamis power of God comes upon you, the explosive power of God. That means in your teaching and preaching, there has to be an explosive power of God that is the evidence that you're children of God. Amen. Can anyone give examples of some of that explosive power of God, apart from the obvious, which is miracles and signs? Can a prophecy be one and um, Paul being bitten by a snake and being unharmed, um, can they be classed as the power of God? Very good, definitely. And what about like peace in like extreme situations when everyone else is melting down, but you're just holding your peace? Like, is that an example of one? Hey, amen, I love that because you see, and that's why I said not miracles, because that miracles is a byproduct. But sometimes people only think that power is, oh, I'm laying hands on the dead and they're raising. No, power is what Tasha just said, that when the world is panicking, you're walking through the fire in peace. Don't worry, we're going to be good. Amen. Um, and Nicole, what she said about, you know, being bitten and again, the same situation. Praise God. I don't know if you've heard this before, but you know when people say, there's a saying that um, people say, like, you are, you've got the patience of a saint or something like that. And in a way, like, that's true because, like, even with David Lynn, for example, like, like, seeing the patience that he has with people, like, that is not even normal. Like, for the everyday person anyway, they would just flip. But the, seeing the way that he handles certain situations, I'm like, wow. Wow, we've got a lie. That's definitely the spirit of God. I mean, I admire um David Lynn's patience. I, I love it. There's something about it. It's a, such a gift. Um, I don't believe I have the same gift as him. Uh, um, I mean, I don't have the same gift as him. I, I might not necessarily need to because personally, I just wouldn't debate with a Muslim personally. That's me. I'm just like, listen, I ain't got time talking about Muhammad yet because I ain't doing that. But with what he does and how he's able to do it. And it's when I look at David Lynn, it's the expression on his face. It doesn't even look angry. It doesn't look like, a, you know, the angry black women when they're in the court and their eyes are going crazy. Like he's just got this straight face and it looks so humble. And I love it. I love that about David Lynn that he will, he will shut someone down. But he has this way of just, because sometimes it's in your face. You can be quiet, but your face is saying the most. His face, when you see him ministering and Muslims are talking the most trash, he's literally there and his face is just cool, like not phased. And I really love that. So yeah, it's definitely a gift of the spirit. Amen. And and when I say I'm not supposed to have it, I don't mean as in the gift of the spirit, but more so as in expertise. Because there's certain fields that, yeah, again, I wouldn't, my particular field wouldn't be debating with somebody for an hour to try and um, persuade them, but you know, he's gifted to do that. So that's why we have to know where we're called to. Amen. I was just also thinking in terms of what Tia was saying as well, he, he that can, a person that can discipline their spirit, their character, um, is definitely something from God and which goes in alignment with the fruits of the spirit as well. Um, I would definitely say. Amen. Any more thoughts before we wrap up? I was just thinking, it seems to be the people that um, don't move in power that seem to have the most to say and be the most boastful. But yeah, they're the same people that don't work in move in power, like all these mega rich churches that run around the church and do all this crazy stuff and they're rich and the churches are like the biggest churches in like the world. But yeah, there's no power there and people are still going there sick. I've even seen churches where they've got... Um, do people that do sign language for deaf people but it's like you should be healing the deaf people not getting people who know how to do sign language so it seems to be those people that are like the most puffed up and have the most to say yet they lack so much power in the church just before katie i think it's so devastating that um and there's a particular church that comes to mind and i'm not going to throw it under the bus because i also respect the church but that particular church that I respect, somebody was was demon possessed in the church, and they called a um, 
ambulance one time uh me and my mom was going to this church a few years ago not go i wasn't going uh religiously i went a few times and when we went there there was a whole ambulance outside and all the rest of it and we was like what's going on and then it took about half an hour for the service to start and we didn't really know what was going on until the end and after speaking with the pastor and he said yeah they were acting a bit strange and he said they've been acting strange recently and there was nothing we could do but send a um ambulance to come and collect them out of the and and actually we knew the woman that's what killed her i remember now we knew the woman and she was cool but clearly she had a manifestation and they called an ambulance and i just think that's so humiliating and degrading degrading and humiliating to the person to be imagine you're in god's house which is supposed to be and you're being taken out by these arrogant ambulance doctors and nurses to be injected and probably section. Now that I know about all this section and stuff, I'm guessing that's what it was. And um, yeah, that was very devastating. And I've heard a few stories like that, you know, where just um, people are in the middle of service and they have to stop the service because somebody died in the service or somebody fell down and then they have to stay. Imagine, imagine your work. How do you even stop a worship song? I would love to know how that works. How does that work? How do you stop a worship song in the middle of it? That wasn't worship. How do you stop? How do you, your your worship and you are alpha and oh, hold on a second saints, um, um, like how do you do that in the middle of a worship song? That means it wasn't really in the throne room of God. It was just a, it was just a tutorial. It was just a performance. Because how do you stop it? You should be singing through that of whatever's happening there. And then people should be ministering while we're praising God. How do you say God is healer? Deliverer, you're my healer. Wait, wait, cut the, cut the sound. Call the ambulance. It's mad, Kaylee. Um, I was just thinking about Tia and just uh, what's been happening in your life. So I was just going to... Read what our written dad puts here. She comes with the power of God that is revealed in her life. Her influence and demonstration of God has caused for those around her to be saved. But obviously, we know it's God, but I think because of your behavior and your actions, it's kind of like God was able to move through that to um, cause those around you, like Storm and Natasha, and we believe more also to be saved so yeah that's what came to mind amen the power of amen. god on tia's life is evident amen which is another good example actually because sometimes as you said she we can look at the power of god as just uh, miracles but it's seen in many different ways and manifestations and tia's life is a good example of it as well Storm is in a deep sleep, yeah? Yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> God bless her in her sleep and in her dreams. Because the spirit is still ministering to her, nevertheless. Sometimes even more powerfully when you're sleeping and your mind is switched off, but your spirit is not sleeping. So, amen. You know. I had one more last thing to say um, quickly. It's just when Paul says at the end, shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? So there's a time for the rod and then there's a time for meekness. It's just knowing and discerning and using your wisdom. When, when is the time for the rod and when is the time to be gentle? Basically the time for correction or the time for love, time for rebuke. The time to beat their backside or the time to bring angel kick. It's mad. Dwayne, are you good? Don't know if Dwayne's sleeping as well. A few people had to drop out today. 
Um, we actually didn't go way far off of what we was last week in terms of time. It was just that we, st- I believe we started a bit later today, around 20 past. So we've been in here for two hours and 18 minutes. So it's not too far off of that. But yeah, does anyone else have anything to to share, Dwayne, if you're with us or anyone else? Tasha? No, nothing to add. Praise God. I think it was all um, summarized anyway today, uh, I believe. I noticed that everything we spoke about was revealed in the next chapter and in repetition, literally repeated over and over again. But um, Corinthians is expansive, nevertheless, it's expansive. And so it goes into many different topics, and, um, which is good to look forward to. So, yeah, praise God, saints, no one else, otherwise we'll close in prayer. Uh, Tia, I was planning to call you um, very quickly after this um, Bible study. It's quite late, but hopefully that is okay. Praise God, can someone close in prayer then? I'll close in prayer. I'll close in prayer since seeing that I didn't <clears throat> open in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your word that was revealed today. Let us pray that it will be sealed, everything perfectly sealed, closed up, just like a zipper bag, um, plastic sealed bag. I pray that it will be sealed even for those who are sleeping currently, those who were joined and those who wasn't able to join. Lord, seal your word with us today. Lord, we take your word, because we know it's not our human wisdom, exactly what we've been taught today, praise God. Um, We take it as a gift and not something that we made up or created or that we can boast in or even boast in our knowledge of because we can't, because it's something that you just gave us in your word and we just repeat what your word says. As many people out here boasting today as if they designed it. But Lord, this is historical. This is the ancient word. This is ancient. And we're simply reviving it by speaking it and believing it in simplicity. And so, Lord, I pray that this ancient word that we revive in speaking it in simplicity, the ancient word, which is your son himself, Yeshua HaMashiach. Lord, I pray, God in heaven, that none of this would be wasted or in vain. Hallelujah. I'm encouraged and I pray that the saints will be encouraged just by the simple motion of going through the word. Hallelujah. So, Lord God, I pray that you seal your doctrine with us today. If the word says everything that we've been taught and everything that is taught in every church that it is taught in, praise God. Seal it with us today. Let it be expansive in our spirits, in our hearts, in our minds. Let it just drive us closer and closer to you in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, Tasha, is he going to say something? No, I wasn't. I forgot to put my thing back on mute. Amen. Kaylee. Uh, I just realized I missed. Um a bit of uh, something that I got before. But um I'll just I'll just write it out um in the Bible study after what I got. Amen. Why does that sound like the Catholic Church or is it just me? <laughs> but I feel like these books are going really quick. Like, I think next after next week, we'll move on to the next book. Like, it's going very quick. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs>
But yeah, good night, Saints, if no one else has anything to share in the group. And yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to running through the chapters as well. We'll be in Revelation before you know it, and then we'll be talking about the next, what we're going to do from there. Maybe Genesis, who knows? But praise God. Good night, everybody. Amen. Good night. 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 Good night.